Hmm, that's better. Still not all the way where I'd like it, but better. I'll take that. So I'm on a mission to work out some sort of coolant system for this saw. Now eventually, or initially, this thing had a complete coolant system on it. Although the pump's missing, all the rest of the built-in coolant system is in, still intact. So from the back of the saw, there's a hose that runs up to this needle valve that operates the flow of coolant, runs through the body of the saw out to a barbed fitting in the front. Coolant and sawing go hand in hand. If you want your blades to last at least 50% longer, and that's not an exaggeration, I think, at all. Run some coolant, apply it to the blade properly, and use the right stuff. It makes an amazing difference. Um, you could literally buy yourself a saw with the money you save on blades if you have a sawing place where you saw stock all the time and the same stuff. If you just used a few tricks when it comes to prolonging band life. There's a few things you can do that really make a huge difference. So we'll talk about those as we go, but first I want to show you what I need to do to these needle valves. Some stuff that I've got as well that are useful to keep in the shop and cheap. So they help you out. They help me out all the time. So let's see if we can't get something straightened out on this saw. I want coolant on it. So both the coolant and the air needle valve have little O-rings on the stem. That way when you open them, fluid or air does not leak out down the stem of the valve and run down the face of the saw. Both of these O-rings on these are rock hard and need replaced. So not too awful long ago, I went to the local freight store and I picked up this set of metric and imperial O-rings. These are made of nitrile rubber, which is great for the majority of stuff that we are gonna deal with in the shop. Fuels, oils, pretty decent temperature range, I mean, on and on and on. They're not exotic, but perfectly suited for, for the workshop in my opinion. So you want some cheap insurance, pick you up a couple of these, put them on the shelf. If you use them twice, they will have paid for themselves if you count the gas and the time and the you know, energy you take to search for what you need. If you get a kit like this, you're pretty much covered for the majority of stuff. So glad I picked these up. Let's cut off these O-rings and uh, replace them so they don't leak. So anytime I have questions about O-rings, and I refer to this O-ring handbook by Parker, this thing covers almost everything you could imagine. And O-rings are extremely deep subject if you want to dig into the weeds on it, how to make them work to their peak, right? How to not have failures, because it is common to have O-ring failures, but most of the time it's due to the improper selection of materials or improper installation. That's what I find anyway. So That's a great book. See if you can pick one up if you uh, are interested. So we're going to use a little ultra high vacuum grease on these O-rings just so they slide around good. That's all I've got, so perfectly fine to use.
So an O-ring seal is used to prevent the loss of fluid or gases. The seal assembly consists of an elastometer O-ring and a gland. An O-ring is a circular cross-section ring molded from rubber. The gland, usually cut into metal or another rigid material, contains and supports the O-ring. The combination of these two elements, O-ring and gland, constitute a classic O-ring seal assembly. So this is my only source of water out here at the shop. I don't have water plumbed out here, not yet anyway. Now, I don't use this to drink, obviously, just to wash my hands or clean up a piece of equipment, but when it starts running low, instead of carrying this jug to the house or down the creek or whatever to get water, I've been taking the outlet of my dehumidifier, putting it in the top of this where it pumps the water out, and in a day I can fill this thing up. So I've been reusing that water that comes out of the air in the shop to, uh, to wash my hands and stuff. So here's a look at the coolant pump that I'm going to try. This is a Little Giant Made in South America submersible pump. This was sent to me by a viewer who had bought it for a project that just didn't work for them, I guess. And they said they had it and would send it to me if I wanted to try to use it on the saw. So you know, I have nothing to lose, so I said, sure, you know, I'll give it a shot. I'm not looking for a huge flow of coolant on this thing. We're not trying to put out a fire. Really, a stream the size of a pencil lid. Maybe 200 thousandths or point four, five millimeter stream would be more than enough if it's well directed. So we're going to give it a try. Whether it will pump up through this long system or not, I don't know. But we won't know until we try. So let's uh, see if we can't get something together and give it a shot. So before I simply show you me hooking up a pump to this thing and getting it to flow, let me first just give you a quick little shot of the backstory. What it took to get just the line from the coolant system to this point right here clear. It was not as easy as just hooking things up. Yep, clog at the uh, union. It's a heck of a clog. So this is not the best setup, best connections, although it doesn't matter, I don't guess. So down in the water, and moment of truth, is it going to work? No. Hmm. That sucks.
But if I siphon it, it worked. Not a very strong stream though. So I'm going to turn that valve off and see if it'll pick it back up. Okay, so it did shut the coolant off. It does work. So actually, that's probably about right, to be honest, if that was directed right on the teeth of the blade. I mean, that's more than enough. So we'll move forward with it, I guess. So what I need to do is cap this hole, so I'm just going to take this piece of half inch thick aluminum, drill a couple holes in it, shape it to something that's a little bit more appealing than this, and uh, put a gasket on it and call it good. So I need this bolt hole spacing, so just zero on one, span the distance. So our center to center on these is 3.492 for all intents and purposes, so we'll close that. We'll re-zero and then check it just by eye, like you would. Just wanted to eyeball it. So we got 3.487. So we drill these holes for clearance. If you even if you did it this way, it'd be more than good enough for the needs here. We'll choose where our first hole is going to be for a punch mark. Your calibers just come out here and that punch mark and swing. So, other hole right there. Yeah, now we need to lay out the shape that we want. So, now we need a center line. So we just line up our two punch marks on the end. So it will be somewhere right around in there. So now we just divide the distance between these two punch marks. So there's close enough. That's our center. I'm going to go ahead and make a little punch mark there. A little deeper than that. is on the end. Now we need to figure out what we want in the center.
So now we've got to cut out the profile real quick. Seeing as we have the chart, let's use it just to see what they recommend. We know it's fast with aluminum. It's always you know, high speed. Let's see what they recommend for this half inch thick aluminum. Just out of curiosity's sake. So there is aluminum. It is saying for a quarter to one inch, we should use a medium feed pressure for our uh, blade. Yeah. 4C, so four tooth per inch would be optimum claw type. C stands for claw. Right. An aggressive tooth. That's what they're that's what they're recommending. And for a surface feet per minute on the blade, it's saying 800. We can run faster than that. We'll run her up to uh, 14 and see how that does. So this blade that I'm running is a 14, a straight 14. TPI. 14 TPI, 35 thousandths of an inch thick, way off what they would really recommend for, for cutting aluminum. But in my shop, on this saw, most likely I'm going to be cutting relatively thin material. And I find that a half inch thick, half inch wide blade, 25 to 35 thousandths of an inch thick, 14 to 18 TPI, works really well. You can cut thicker stuff with a finer pitched blade. You just got to be careful and apply quite a bit more pressure to generate a chip because if you're not generating a chip you're generating heat and you don't want that because that will deteriorate your blade life. So not the most ideal blade in this situation but they work. So there it is, roughed out. I'm definitely not the world's best band machinist. So I don't want this pump sitting directly on the bottom, sucking up a bunch of junk. So I've got a little platform in, in there for it to sit on. And this thing fits in here like it was made for it almost. Now i got to get the coolant in there without spilling it everywhere. So this square cat litter bucket, a little easier to pour from. Spill any. That's good. So not too long ago, we made a really nice upgrade to the channel art. This was done by a friend of mine's son, Zach Erdman, and I really appreciate him. And he really nailed uh, the artwork here. He done an amazing job. The detail in this is uh, surprising, to say the least. So I wrote him back. I said, "Would you be interested in doing some artwork for other?" other people and he replied back yes that's what he loves to do artwork is his passion and he just works he actually works for his father in their woodworking business in the office as far as I as far as I heard so if you'd like to help like to help a young guy out and uh, starting a business doing something that he loves and you need some artwork for your business for your YouTube channel Facebook Instagram whatever contact Zek he'd done some awesome work for me and I'm sure he would for you too funlovingdrawings at gmail.com. So thank you, Zach. I really appreciate it. You know, he didn't ask for a plug, but I think uh, it was well-deserved. And uh, man, if he does work like this, you know, he can do big things. So thank you, Zach. I appreciate it. Go check him out. Send him an email. So I really want to hook my coolant line to this blade guard here. We've got a couple holes on each side, maybe I can hook something down. And then when I go to change blades, this will open up and fold out of the way. But the problem is, a big old gash in it there from the blade getting into it. 
and it's supposed to go on a stud with a wing nut here, but the stud is missing. So I'm going to straighten up these bends, weld up this gap, and put a stud in this. That way I can fasten my coolant to where it points right down on the blade. That's the idea anyway. Missing the stud there. It's just welded on, and then that big old nasty uh, cut in the front. It's already been broke here once, but it's not a problem. So this piece of stock that I got on the track anvil here is eighth of an inch thick. It's low carbon steel ground stock, 3.175 millimeters thick. I'm going to be using that as a backer to help me weld up the gap in this uh, blade guard because it's a pretty large gap. So I'm just going to use a C-clamp behind that to hold that in place and then puddle my weld on this piece of backer. That's the idea anyway. Just got to mark this out and uh, cut it to width. It's a little wide. So see how large that gap is? I want to cut off just that little section there. And the problem with that is it'll want to pull this down into that gap. So I'll show you a little trick that I use at work. And that's take a piece of plastic, a piece of steel, you know, it doesn't matter. And cut it way back on the blade and then use this as your work table. It just supports the work better. easier to do it with this than it would to try to do it on that. So there's our backer clamped in place. And we'll just take this over to the welding bench and fill in all that gap. So I'm really excited to say that I got a new welder in the shop, one that's capable of welding aluminum now. It Everybody knows up to this point I've been using a little Harbor Freight welder pretty much exclusively and you know, don't have anything bad to say about it. For the price point, that little thing was, was awesome and did the majority of the stuff that I wanted to do. But a viewer of the channel, Joe, out of uh, Connecticut, contacted me. He works at Welt Pro, and he's the customer service guy, super nice guy, contacted me. He had watched some of my videos a while back where I said I did not have the capability to weld aluminum, and he said, I could probably help you out, and he did. So I'm going to go over this thing a little bit, get a little more time on it before I... You know, I officially show it and its features, but this thing's packed with features compared to the little uh, Harbor Freight welder, which had uh, a frequency start, and that's it. So we'll get a little time on this thing, and then I'll publicly share it and go over, over it with you and tell you my thoughts on it. Is it a good welder, or is it a POS? But so far, so good. This thing, I like it. I'll say that uh, as of now, which could change, but... I'm having fun with this little welder, as little as I've used it so far, but... I mean, this welder is not a $4,000 Miller Dynasty 200, but it amazes me what you can get for your money now versus what you could have got for the same money, you know, 10 years ago. In in the world of welders, anyway, in inverter welders, so they've really progressed just at a lightning pace, and... You know, about anybody can get in the market for a, with a decent welder for a reasonable amount of money. 
which used to was not the case. So this blade guard is really not all that thick, and that backer that I put on there also acts as a heat sink. Helps me to keep from blowing out this gap when I'm trying to weld it up because it's a pretty big, pretty big void there that I have to fill or, or bridge, which can be tough. But the backer makes all the difference in the world. And 42 amps, 43 amps, you've seen it. Uh, just washing over the weld here to smooth it out, make it look a little prettier using 308 filler rod. So nothing real special. Just cleaning it up. This will last forever and uh, we'll grind off the excess. So the majority of the coolant that comes out of the nozzle here will go straight down through the gap into the body of the saw, but that that gets splashed on the table will get into the, into the slots or the channels and run around and go down this hole here, which is a, just a drain that goes through a tube to the same section of the saw where it would end up if it went down through the slot. And then it goes down into here and all of this is enclosed down in here and it gets channeled out this slot here so all of the coolant that gets down through the slot or through the hose from the table comes out the slot and into this tray. This tray catches all of that coolant and all the chips that get washed down. This container fills up until it gets to these screens here then it drains back through into the coolant reservoir and it starts all over again. What well, doesn't end up on the floor anyway? I've made a couple uh, special changes to the <laughs> to the saw to make sure that the majority of it stays inside the saw. So because the big red toolbox is as good a place as any to put stickers, I've decided that that's where they're going to go. So put some of the overflow, some of the new ones that have come in, some that I've had duplicates of. And I've got a few new ones that have come in over the last few months, and I want to share those with you. I've also got a couple of viewer gifts, really nice, that I appreciate, and I'll share those as well. So here's our four new stickers from three individuals. We have Harold Walters from the ARW Workshop. He's down in Texas. Really nice guy. like watching him. We have Billy Huddleston from Knox Machining. He's often on uh, Harold's live stream. And I believe Billy runs a makerspace uh, down in Knoxville as well, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And then we have Mark Newsom out of Dalton Furnace, UK. Sent me a t-shirt all the way over here as well. Nice letter. Um, Mark is in the process of, well he was when he sent me this six months ago, in the process of moving shop, working on motorcycles, doing some repairs and stuff. So thank you guys for sending these stickers in. And if you want your sticker up here, send me an email and I will tell you where to send it. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. So here's the setup. First cut's going to be a pretty tough one, and that is on an old carbide tool holder. Somebody's ground on this one and ruined it, so it's just 
good quality steel is all it is. A lot of people are familiar with these and tried to tried to machine them. They are some really tough stuff. And this one tests on my Rockwell tester about 40 C. So it's pretty pretty tough. Got a little setup here to hold it. We're just going to use the hydraulic table, let the saw do the cutting around 100 surface feet per minute, bi-metal blade. We're gonna just push hard and generate a chip and it should cut this no problem. So let's get, to, let's get everything rolling and make the cut and test out this coolant system. It's working really nice. Check that out. Worked really well. You know, it helps to look at your chips because they should be a nice little curl, much like uh, chips off the lathe. You don't want them discolored or anything. And it's all the same same idea, really. So we've got good chips here. You know, we didn't obviously didn't overheat the blade and got a nice nice surface finish. Good square cut in a reasonable amount of time, so nothing wrong with that. Nice chips. All right, guys, that's it this week. Feels good to have the coolant system at least functioning on that saw. It may not be exactly what I want, but I think it's plenty good enough and should should meet my needs anyway. Um, whether the pump holds up and my little delivery system to the blade holds up, you know, only time will tell. But I don't think that it'll give me any problems. But we'll see. So. That was the last thing on that saw that I really needed to check off the list before I would consider it ready ready to use. After who knows how long that saw has been used without being properly maintained, it really did need a lot of little things. Nothing major, but almost everything that could need attention did in some way or another, and I've pretty much gone over, over all of it. So ready to use and I won't have to worry about it breaking down in the middle of a project and having to stop what I'm doing to fix a piece of equipment because I, I like working on equipment but I don't like having to stop what I'm doing to fix a piece of equipment that should work. So I like to straighten all that stuff out right at the beginning when I get a piece because you're never more excited uh, to get to work on a piece of equipment than you are when you first get it. So I like to take advantage of that and just get everything all the maintenance work behind me right in the beginning. So I think that's it. Man, the shop's really coming around. Um, it's a, starting to turn into what I envisioned before all the construction of this shop uh, started over a year ago. So still not finished, but do they ever get finished? So I'm gonna pour a pad out front, fix this floor over here, and uh, add a few other features on this building, and then 
we'll have a super nice shop. Not that I don't already. Uh, it's light years better than it was. And uh, I've heard a lot of people say that they would love to have a shop, you know, like what I've got. And all I can say is that it can happen if you really, really want it. But you have to want it so bad that you uh, are willing to work after work. Willing to work till the sun goes down and past that. Because that's what I've done for the last year and a half, basically, to get to this point. And just keep on keeping on. That's it. So thanks to everybody who's helped me get here. I really appreciate it. I definitely didn't do it alone. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, and subscribers, and anybody who's helped me get to this point and move forward from here. So that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes.